If you have a Bible and you'd like to turn to Psalm 136, um, that's the psalm we're going to be looking at uh, for this brief devotional this morning. It's been very interesting over the last few days. I don't know how many other people have seen this, uh, but on Facebook, some people have chosen um, the discipline of uh, finding something to express thanks for every day during the month of November. And I don't know if that was something that people did and then Facebook kind of fitted it or whether Facebook has um, stimulated that activity. Um, it's certainly a useful discipline uh, to try and think of something to thank the Lord for every day that we are alive. And the things that have been coming up there have ranged from peanut butter um, through to uh, fuzzy robes and slippers right the way through to Christ himself and, uh, and the wonders of salvation in him. And, um, and that's not inappropriate either, to be thankful in the small things as well as in the great things of life. If all we can find to be thankful for is peanut butter, then we probably have a little bit of an issue. Yeah, BJ's agreeing with that one as well. Yeah, um, peanut butter on its own is, is a curious uh, substance. But anyway, that's for another time. Um, when I was at college, we had a, a thing called a day of evangelism. And, uh, and then back uh, last month, every year now, it seems that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And again, those things are fine, um, but our life is to be a life of evangelism, not a day. Um, and I hope we appreciate uh, Pastor Bryant more than for the month of October and then, uh, and then the rest of the year we have the Rotten Tomatoes ready to sling um, whenever it feels like it. Same with Thanksgiving. Um, it's good to have a day of Thanksgiving. It's good to think of something every day in the month of November. Um, but our whole lives are to be lives of Thanksgiving. And certainly the Old Testament saints were encouraged everywhere uh, to give thanks to the Lord. And there is one refrain that you will find very often repeated in the Old Testament. And it is this, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Uh, you'll see it in 1 Chronicles 16.34. You'll see it when Solomon institutes the temple worship in, in the temple that had just been completed in 2 Chronicles 5.13, 7.3, and 7.6. Because it was such a part of the temple worship, you'll find it everywhere in the Psalms. Psalm 100 verse 5, Psalm 103 uh, verse 17, Psalm 106 Verse 1, Psalm 107, verse 1. Psalm 118, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, where you'll find everyone is encouraged to do it. Um, Israel, let Israel say his loving kindness is everlasting. Well, don't read the Psalms and think, well, that was good for Israel. I'm glad that they were being encouraged uh, to give thanks to the Lord because we are now the Israel of God. And that encouragement is addressed to us. Let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Well, let's not think, well, that was good for that Old Testament priesthood. Because we are now the priesthood of God. That charge comes to us to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And just in case there was any doubt, he says, let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. And we as the children of God are those who fear the Lord. Later on in the psalm, it's in verse 29. It's in Psalm 138, verse 8. That's all to do with the worship of God. The temple, you know, you can imagine almost that you couldn't go to a temple uh, worship service and probably to a synagogue service Without hearing this, people were appointed to say this very thing, to praise God with these very words. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. You'll find it in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 21. When Israel goes out in battle, a 
And what do they cry out? What is their theme? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then Jeremiah is a very sad uh, passage in a way because it looks at the desolation that's being brought upon the, the land and upon uh, Jerusalem because of Israel's disobedience and their adultery uh, with God going after idols. And it, it, it pictures the idea that this will no longer be heard in the temple. This will no longer be the chorus of God's people to God, but encouragingly Jeremiah prophesies it will be heard again. The people of God will return and again they will lift up their voices and they will sing, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Now, if anything is repeated in scripture you, you can be pretty sure it's important. But when something is repeated as often as this, um, we've got to pay special attention to it. It's the theme song, if you like, of divine worship in the Old Testament. The phrase is used over and over again. Now, I've skipped over the psalm that I think you've probably turned to by now. Psalm 136, because that's where we're going to focus our meditation for the rest of our time this morning, uh, because the phrase is used again and again here as an encouragement to us. So let's just read Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. I tell you what, as I read this, uh, take up the refrain with me, okay? So I'll start each verse, and then let's join together with the refrain, like the people of the Old Testament. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens and the earth, uh, the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness is everlasting. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, for his loving kindness is everlasting and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness is everlasting. But he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smote great kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And slew mighty kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Zion, king of the Amorites, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And Og, king of Bashan, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And gave their land as a heritage, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Even a heritage to Israel, his servant, for his loving kindness is everlasting who remembered us in our low estate, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and has rescued us from our adversaries, for his loving kindness is everlasting, who gives food to all flesh, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness is everlasting. It's like the Facebook of the psalmist, isn't it? 
not necessarily one thing to give thanks for for every day of the month of November, but again and again and again. And what I want us to do today, not just in this uh, short time that we have now, but for the whole day, is to own this psalm and to make it ours, uh, to take it home and to meditate upon it, uh, to have that refrain burned into our thinking uh, and warming our hearts. So let's just take a look at it. Um, we're just going to unpack it very briefly. Why should we give thanks to the Lord? Hopefully you've got a pretty good idea by now what the answer to that question is. We should give thanks to the Lord because he's good. And uh, Pastor Bryant uh, in our series on the attributes of God I think more than once said, imagine a God who had all this power and all this knowledge who was not good. What would he be like? A God of infinite um, and, and frightening power, uh, but who was not good. That would be a, a terrible thing to think about. But he is good. Uh, as they said about Aslan the lion, he is not safe, but he is good. And uh, that goodness, uh, his moral perfection, permeates through all of his actions. Um, they are, all of them are conditioned by his goodness. And because of that, says the psalmist, we should thank him. Well, how do we know that God is good? Well, this refrain tells us. For his loving kindness is everlasting. That word loving kindness means Mercy, kindness, love, especially steadfast love, love by which God has bound himself to his people in covenant. Now, it's easy uh, when you're thinking about the attributes of God to rattle them off. God is mercy, he is love, he's kind, he's good, he's uh, the God of steadfast love. And you get to the end of the list and your heart hasn't been moved by it at all. Uh, but just pause on those things. God is merciful. Um, what does that mean? He does not give us what we deserve. We know that. He has not treated us as our sins deserve. Rather, he has treated us in love for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is kind. What does it mean that God is kind? To whom does he display his goodness in this world? Everyone. He doesn't make a distinction in his common grace. He showers his love and his good things upon all. He is kind and especially kind to those whom he has loved from before the foundation of the world. And it's a steadfast and unmovable love. And it has to be. How do we know that God's love must be steadfast? It must be unchanging. I think we heard about this a couple of Sunday evenings ago. How do we know that? Because he doesn't change. He can't change. So his love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well then, we know that he's good because of his everlasting loving kindness. How do we know uh, his everlasting loving kindness? How do we see that in practice? And the psalmist tells us. As we read through, perhaps you saw some of the themes um, that he took upon his heart uh, to cause him to give thanks to the Lord for his everlasting uh, loving kindness. How do we know God is a God of steadfast love? Well, he alone does great wonders. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords 
And we see his loving kindness in created things. You want something to thank God for, says the psalmist? Well, thank him for his creation, because his character is revealed there. Paul tells us in Romans, his eternal power, his divine nature. Here are wonders of God. Uh, the greatest physicists who've ever lived still haven't been able to figure out how the cosmos works. They keep discovering new little particles, and then they have to think, well, there must be another one, because this just doesn't add up at the moment. And then they start looking for another one. And they still haven't figured it out. And they still don't really know, I think, what happens at the heart of a black hole. Um, but God does. It's not a mystery to him. He does wonders. His creation is a wonderful thing. Um, Pam and I... Uh, marveled in his creation uh, down in Tasmania and, uh, and then in New Zealand. Wonderful scenery, beautiful places, gorgeous. Um, and how those things are given by God out of love in order to, for us to enjoy and to delight our hearts. Uh, Dick and Lita are rejoicing in a new granddaughter. Dick uh, was persuaded. We had to twist his arm last night, but he got some photographs out and, and showed us and uh, what a delight she is, and, and what a joy to them. The creation of God. Nobody understands that either. Uh, but God does. And in his love, he gives us such precious gifts. Uh, the psalmist moves on. Creation. What about the new creation? You want something to give thanks to God for? Thank him for his redemption. Israel was a slave to Egypt. Pharaoh was oppressing them. And God overthrew him while you were a slave to Satan, a slave to sin. Those were your oppressors, and God sent the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross in order that he would overturn the rule of Satan in your heart. When you were held hostage, what was the ransom to set you free? It was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want something to give thanks for? Redemption. Being bought with the blood of Christ. Brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. What else? Well, having redeemed Israel, he then provided for them in the wilderness. He led them through, and when they were threatened by enemies as his redeemed people, Sihon, and Og, he defeated them. And they stand for all the forces that come against us as the elect of God. They do not stand a chance against us, not because of who we are, but because if God is with us and for us, who can be against us? Who can lay any charge to God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? We see his loving kindness also in the fact that we have an inheritance uh, that has been prepared already. It's ready for us now. There it is in verses 21 and 22. Just as he had an inheritance ready for Israel, so he has an inheritance ready for us. Verse 25, he provides for our bodies as well as our souls. So you want reasons to praise God? What about his creation? What about his new creation? What about his protection and his preservation? What about his provision? What about our inheritance that he has given to us, again, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well then, how long will this loving kindness of God last? Will it stop tomorrow? Will it stop when the days of November run out and there's no more reason to give thanks? I don't think so. How long does the psalmist say it will last? Forever. When did it begin? The loving kindness of God for you as his child, on what day, at what time, 
Did God decide to love you? Yeah, there was no day. There was no time. It has always been in the character of God. You have always held a special place in his heart. When we were down in New Zealand and David Jones was preaching, he's actually preaching on the Holy Spirit and the seal of the Spirit. And uh, he, he, he pictured God looking down uh, from heaven, as it were, and seeing those who have the seal of the Spirit, the ownership, the mark of God's ownership upon them, and saying, that's my boy. That's my girl. Or those big, long photographs uh, from school, you know, with a thousand kids on. And what, where, where do parents look? What, what they want to find their boy. Don't they want to find their child, their daughter? And they look through, ah, oh, there she is. There he is. God's love didn't have a beginning for you. And when's it going to end? Never. It can't end any more than God has an end. His love is everlasting. There's a hymn that uh, Pam and I uh, used to sing back in the UK. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace that love to know. Spirit breathing from above. Thou hast taught me it is so in a love which cannot cease. I am his, and he is mine. Who can sever that love? Can any force on this earth, can anything in heaven, can any force or power in hell separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? No, impossible. Can't happen. Then we should give thanks. Verse 23 and verse 24, he remembered us in our low estate, he took pity upon us, slaves to sin, and he rescued us from our adversaries. Now, there is enough material here in just these few short points to thank him eternally. And he is worthy of it. It's not just an Old Testament thing. They didn't have to stop, you know, Giving thanks to God didn't become so yesterday when the Old Testament finished and the New Testament began. Now let's move on and do something different. 1 Thessalonians 5:18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together.